Okay, so let's kick off. Um, Pankaj, we're good to go, right? Yes, we are live. Excellent, thank you. So uh, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to uh, our webinar on both the, the latest quarter's results for uh, Marcellus, uh, Marcellus's investing companies, and also on the, on the macro situation, right? The macro situation is looking decidedly interesting with the potential for war in one part of the world, and, and I'll also talk about interest rate hikes. So we thought it'd be a good juncture for both uh, for us to give you a perspective on how the portfolio companies are shaping up on their fundamentals. Uh, generally, we're actually very pleased with how they are shape, shaping up basis, uh, not just the recent quarter's results, but also the full year's results. Uh, uh, but before we get on to the, the specifics of the portfolio companies, I'll, I'll start off with a, a perspective on the macro uh, position, and then we'll go to the fund managers, the portfolio managers one by one, uh, starting with Rakshit. Uh, uh, we'll start, we'll go to the portfolio managers one by one for them to give up, uh, for them to share their thoughts on the the investment, uh, the investment, uh, 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 the investment uh, outlook, and both the, and the results of this quarter. So, so let me start with the question that you know we get asked uh, very often over the last six months, right? And, and there's this there's this widespread notion that that interest rate hikes are somehow bad for the stock market, right? Um, now, we, one can have lots of notions, uh, but uh, obviously, in the real world, if your notions, your beliefs are grounded in reality you're more likely to succeed but if your if your beliefs are grounded in complete fantasy it's obviously going to be a challenge and and i think this rate hikes leading to stock market corrections is one such belief it's grounded in zero data and plenty of fantasy so let's start with the the first uh, point of view so let's start with us recessions and 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 india's uh, india's economy we pointed this out 22nd march 2020 so 2 years ago when the Two years ago, when the world was world was uh, uh, in in full panic, we, the world was in full panic courtesy COVID. We pointed out, and using exactly this visual, we simply extended it, updated it, using this visual on twenty second March twenty twenty. We said that you can see the data, you can see in the red chevrons. Whenever the United States has a recession, the grey bars, uh, the Indian economy soon follows with an economic boom. The the green bars, right? So the grey bars are U.S. recessions. The green the green areas are Indian economic booms. The red is the indicator which trigger which is indicating the difference between the U.S. recession ending and the Indian economic boom are beginning. We further showed uh, using the, the the orange line and the blue line that that this has happened. This has happened due to two factors because uh, the crude crude oil price, the orange line. Crude oil drops by 50 to 80 percent when America goes into recession, and secondly, and secondly, uh, 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 the U.S. 10-year bond deal, the blue line, drops by two to two and a half percent when the American economy goes into recession. Nothing mysterious here. The U.S. bond deal drops by two to two and a half percent. The U.S. oil, the global oil price, drops by 50 to 80 percent. And hey, presto! Surprise, surprise! You give India cheap oil and cheap money, we have an economic boom. This has happened four times in the last. For, uh, last 40 years, uh, basically in all of our lifetimes, uh, this has happened four times, and thus a US, uh, uh, US recession is a necessary and sufficient condition for an Indian economic recovery. We, do, we never get a boom without a recession in America, and if there's a recession in America, we unfailingly have an economic boom. All of this we pointed out. All of this we pointed out uh, a couple of years ago, right? And, and, and you know, we've just simply updated that chart. Now, there is no change in this picture. Right, as predicted by us, and you know, uh, 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 we uh, we shouted. I remember doing a webinar on fifteenth March. It wasn't a webinar; it was one of those. In those days, we used to do it on a phone call. A thousand of you joined in from a phone call. Uh, Rakshit and I joined in from our lockdown stricken homes. And uh, as usual, I had the worst line I think in the universe. I was shouting on the phone saying, "There'll be an economic boom in India." There was no Zoom in those in that era. Feels uh, feels strange now. Without Zoom, I was shouting into a phone line. <laughs> There's going to be an economic boom. We were writing newsletters and we were all sitting at home, uh, trying to cheer ourselves up. Uh, as 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 uh, the prime minister told us that you have to sit at home for the next couple of weeks. Now, two years on, this has broadly worked out. What happens now? Rising interest rates are bad for the stock market. No, not really. The data doesn't show that. 
So why doesn't the data show that uh, rising interest rates are bad for the stock market? So let's start with a little bit of common sense and we'll, we'll come on to the data. Typically, central bankers hike rates when the economy is overheated and the economy is absolutely going gangbusters. Uh, uh, central bankers hike rates to take some of the steam out of the economy, right? Why do they do that? Why do they take some of the steam out of the economy? Because if you take some of the steam out of the economy, you elongate, you extend the economic recovery, right? This is not sort of this is not some sort of punishment that the central banker is exerting. The central banker hikes rates gradually as the economic recovery proceeds to elongate the the economic recovery, and therefore, for two very good reasons, rising interest rates are good for the stock market. A, it's a signal that the economy is in great shape. And B, it's a signal from the central bank that's saying, I want to elongate this recovery. I want to extend the recovery, right? And therefore, both in America and in India, 70 years of data shows that rising interest rates tend to be accompanied by rising stock markets, right? In fact, the S&P 500 typically compounds at 9% per annum. Uh, uh, when rates are being hiked. There's been 12 rate hike cycles since the Second World War. In 11 out of 12 of these, the US stock market has been on a bull run. If you look at the last two bouts of, if you look at the last two bouts of big rate hikes, which happened in this century in America, 2004 to 6, the Fed hiked, I think, nine times. 2004 to 6, the Fed hiked nine times. The S&P 500 went up by 50% in those two years. The Indian stock market nearly doubled in those two years. More recently, 2015 to 2019, I think the Fed hiked by 2.25%, something like 15 rate hikes, cumulatively 2.25% rate hike between 2015 and 2019. In just the first two years of that rate hike cycle, the S&P 500 went up 50%, right? So anybody out there who tells you that US interest rates are growing, S&P 500 niche jata hai, please ask them to check the data because the data doesn't agree with them. Now, let's come to India. And what happens in India? Surprise, surprise, no different. We are also a free market economy. Uh, in India, this century, in India, in this century, there have been four instances of sustained rate hikes, right? Multiple rate hikes, char bar hua hai in this century. In every single one of those periods, the Nifty has generated healthy returns. How much? What are the returns like? Here we go. Here's the data, right? You had 29% compounded, 03 to 08. I'm sure you, many of you remember that boom. Uh, 2009 to 12, right? In, 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 in Indian economic history, that was seen as a muted boom because only 17% compounded right? in, in that period. I think uh, 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 so, uh, the, the, then, then RBI governor did, I think, 16 rate hikes between 9 to 12, 17% compounded. 2013-14, this is the, the, uh, 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 the cycle which uh, uh, overlapped with BJP coming to power. And, and then the last one, uh, 2017 to 18, remember I said the Fed was hiking, we were hiking as well, decent stock market. So notion that hiking in, hike, uh, rising in interest rates leads to a bear market, unfortunately, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Rising interest rates usually happen in an economic recovery and lead to stock market, stock markets rising as well. Now let's come to the next uh, um, uh, notion that is paraded, that is put out in front of uh, investors. The notion is, uh, is that somehow, uh, again, based on you know where people find these notions, I find very interesting. But let me first give you the notion. The notion is, the myth is high inflation is bad for high quality stocks, right? Now, you'll have to be a little challenged on common sense to make this point of view that high inflation is bad for high quality stocks. Because as we just discussed, an economy picks up steam. When an economy picks up steam, inflationary pressures build up. That's what we discussed in the preceding slides. In such circumstances, when inflationary pressures pick up, every shred of data shows that high quality companies of the sort that we will discuss over the next 45 minutes, as inflationary pressures pick up, high quality companies become even more dominant in, in growing their PBT margins, growing their revenues, and growing their share prices, right? Let's quantify. So what we did was we looked at every single month in this century, starting with July 2000, ending with July 2021. That's a total of 262 months. We said how many of these months was CPI inflation above 6%, right? High inflation, CPI inflation above 6%. We found that 105 months out of 262, CPI inflation was, was above was above 5, above 5, 6%, right? What happened in those months, right? The data is easy to get. It's in front of you. 
Uh, we define quality stocks just for simplicity. We define quality stocks as CCP stocks and KCP stocks, consistent compounder stocks and kings of capital stocks. We found that their PBT margin, their PBT margin growth is a good 8.7 percentage points faster, greater than the Nifty in months in which inflation is high. It's not a surprise. Our fund managers will explain to you in a minute why PBT margin rips away. PBT margin outperformance is even greater for strong franchises in high inflation months. Even most intriguingly, revenue growth is superior, markedly superior for high quality stocks. Uh, in high inflation months, right? Because the pricing power is greater for these companies, their revenue growth becomes markedly superior to the typical Nifty stock in, in high inflation months. And if you join, obviously, if your revenues are doing better than the Nifty, uh, your PBT margin is doing better than the Nifty, your share price returns are 10 percentage points superior to the Nifty when inflation is high. Right. In fact, uh, uh, you know, we published a blog on this. You can read it at your leisure. It's on our website. We've shown you that when it, when CPI inflation is below two percent, when CPI inflation is below two percent, which means uh, inflationary pressures are subdued, that's when low quality companies of the sort that our rivals love to invest in, when CPI inflation is below two percent, that's when low quality companies actually uh, regain some sort of parity with high quality companies. But in an environment where inflation is high, there is no chance for the low quality company. The Marcellus Investing Company mercilessly pummels them on top line, bottom line and share price compounding. We will give you examples of this uh, from the portfolio companies uh, as our fund managers take you through the portfolios. So, so let's, uh, uh, let's go through to our fund managers. We'll start with CCP. Uh, Rakshit, over to you. Thanks, Aurab. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, just to summarize using this slide, what the consistent compounders is fundamental compounding really, really uh, has been like and is expected to be like. Uh, so historically speaking, uh, as the first three columns of this table show you, over the last five years, 10 years, and 15 years, the rate of free cash flow compounding has been in the mid to high 20s, right? Uh, now, interestingly, that's not really the rate at which their profits have compounded, profits have compounded at around, at around 10 percentage point lower, uh, which, which, is, which is more like a high teens to 20s, right? So uh, how, does that, how does that really stack up? So uh, typically speaking, these companies in the past have compounded their revenues in mid to high teens. Uh, there has been a little bit of an operating profit margin expansion, uh, which has led to profit after tax compounding at closer to 20%. And then uh, there is massive investment in uh, investment in compressing working capital cycles and uh, a lot of work to sweat your assets harder and hence generate higher asset turnovers. And compressed working capital cycles uh, lead to operating cash flow growing at a higher rate than profit after tax. And uh, higher asset turnovers lead to free cash flow compounding, uh, eventually being higher than higher than operating cash flows. Right. So that's the reason why you see the 10 percentage point gap. Um, and remember the number uh, uh, on revenue growth historically being mid to high teens, because we'll show you how things are progressing in our portfolio as we speak. Um, so Saurabh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. So uh, this is how the consistent compounders portfolio companies is fundamentals have, uh, have been progressing. Uh, the first column is year on year, third quarter, uh, FY22, which is December 21 quarter, uh, sales growth. So this is December 21 over December 20. However, uh, this is uh, in some cases, not so much of a fair comparison because uh, you can argue that December 20 quarter was during the middle of uh, the COVID crisis when logistics was a challenge and many companies uh, as a result had a low base. So let's not uh, 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 be happy about a high rate of growth on top of a low base. And hence, we uh, looked at a two-year CAGR. So a more relevant column is the second column, which is the uh, December 21 quarter over December 19 quarter, right? So de December 19 quarter had no, uh, no ounce of COVID in it. Uh, and December 21 quarter is the most recently reported quarter. When you look at the annualized rate of growth over the last two years as a result, um, you see that uh, all of these non-lending companies in our portfolio have compounded at mid-20s, right? Um, uh, this is very interesting because on the previous slide, I was, uh, I was highlighting that historically, the rate of revenue growth of our portfolio companies has been in the mid to high teens, 
right? So this rate of growth is a good five to seven percentage point higher than what it used to be prior to prior to COVID, right? And you can see you can see how uh, an Asian paints uh, uh, gaining share when COVID actually led to. Uh, many residential complexes not allowing carpenters and painters and uh, uh, home building influencers to enter. Asian Paints uh, saw a saw a massive 2.7 percent market share gain. Right on top of it, it actually pulverized an organized segment by expanding its retail touch points uh, from around 90,000 uh, prior to COVID to around 140, 150,000 today. Right, and that increase, that uh, literally more than 50% increase in the largest paint companies' de dealer network during the last uh, seven quarters is remarkable, and it has happened only because of market share gains. Um, and on top of it, an Asian Paints has also added new revenue growth drivers, right? Uh, waterproofing growing at 40-50% CAGR, and uh, and a new uh, set of categories being expanded into, which will be disruptors, massive disruptors. If you are looking for new age companies, this is as good as it gets in getting a new age company via via home improvement services and home decor services being attempted as a disruptor in the paints industry. Right. Likewise for a Pedialyte, uh, uh, Titan, uh, Page Industries, the Page actually nearly doubled its. Um, its multi-brand outlet uh, 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 expand, uh, expands from around 55,000 two years ago to 78,000 one year ago and to 205,000, right? Uh, uh, that's a massive increase uh, over a two year period. And on top of it expanded its, uh, its, uh, its whole range of products, et cetera, completely automated the front end, uh, completely automated the new manufacturing setups coming out at the back end. Um, right, Dr. Lal Path Labs and Pedialyte went ahead and acquired uh, a, a few assets. So Pedialyte acquired uh, Araldite, Dr. Lal acquired Suburban. Uh, synergies of those are yet to play out. Right, uh, those are the sorts of examples of uh, tech investments, acquisitions, uh, expansion of the dealer network when competition was crippled. These are the reasons why revenue growth rates of these companies are are way higher now than what it used to be prior to COVID. Like, uh, this is non-lenders. Uh, sorry, let's go to the lending segment. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, these are the four uh, financial sector companies in our, in our portfolio. And you can see uh, that the annualized quarter-on-quarter -quarter loan book growth, the bold highlighted text, the annualized sequential loan book growth rates have started inching uh, uh, to a level again, for many lenders, higher than what it used to prevail prior to COVID, right? Um, this uh, uh, is happening largely because of, again, massive opportunity uh, uh, through higher capital adequacy ratios when competition is competition has been has been crippled to an extent uh, through uh, through COVID on the balance sheet. Um, just to give you some quantified example of how this is played out within the organized segment, right? So if you go to the next slide. Um, Yeah, so uh, the table on the left is uh, is of the paint industry. Uh, there, there's been there's been a good ten to fifteen percentage point gap opened up between an Asian Paints and an Aerolac or an Asian Paints and an Axonobel. Uh, prior to COVID, this gap was no wider than five six percent. Right, the gap has opened up much wider, and this remember is organized uh, company which is Asian Paints versus another organized company, right? Which is say Nerolac or Axonobel. Um, far greater gap opening up has happened between unorganized and, and, and an Asian Paints and a Berger, right? Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's reflected over a, uh, over a third quarter number. More interestingly, when you look at the progression from second quarter to third quarter, right? You can see an acceleration, right? This acceleration is still continuing. A large part of it is again, unorganized to organized, which all companies are benefiting from. And then there is another another angle to it, which is uh, the gap between an Asian paints and the competition has widened further compared to what it was two quarters ago. Similar story for for diagnostic sector, right? You can see the listed uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so Dr. Lal versus Metropolis Cyrocare SRL. Um, the gap between Dr. Lal and Metropolis till three quarters ago in their growth rates used to be no more than one or two percentage points, if at all. 
right? And uh, and this is quite remarkable. Uh, prior to COVID, um, uh, the rate of growth for the two companies was neck to neck, right? Uh, just see what has happened in the last couple of quarters, right? And uh, also look at the progress from what happened in the second quarter to the third quarter. Um, uh, just uh, uh, worth understanding, this is excluding COVID-related testing. This is non-COVID recurring business. This is also excluding suburban acquisition. So this is like for like organic growth of Dr. Lal versus, versus say Metropolis, uh, Dr. Lal versus a thyroid care. The gap opening up is representative of what these firms have done in an organic manner. On top of it are going to be synergies derived from a suburban diagnostics acquisition for a Dr. Lal. On top of it will be benefits from heavy investment that Dr. Lal has done into smaller cities to build the home sample collection infrastructure. Remember, prior to COVID, there was no reason why a small uh, small town household uh, uh, would see people, people calling phlebotomists home. Uh, people would just walk over to a lab, give their sample and come back. Uh, COVID forced them to experience the convenience of home sample collection. And Dr. Lal is capitalizing on that uh, 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 experience that people have had by investing in the infrastructure way ahead of anybody else and hence deepening their presence in the North and East uh, before they, they also benefit from the uh, Western, Western uh, 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 expansion through suburban, et cetera, right? Um, let's click one more time, Saurabh, and, and the lenders bit will come up. So uh, the loan book growth differential between an HDFC bank, Kotak, and Bajaj Finance versus the average for the banking industry has also widened. Right. Uh, this is again organized versus unorganized versus organized, and you can see how the health of the balance sheet compares for these three lenders against the against the industry. So summarizing again, um, first and foremost, competition got crippled in the last couple of years, and hence market share gains got accelerated. This was predominantly from unorganized competition market share gains happening, but also to an extent organized weaker infrastructure related competitors. Uh, who, who couldn't cope up as well as our portfolio companies have done. Secondly, uh, a significant capital allocation, uh, firstly around acquisitions, next around, uh, uh, around uh, 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 technology, around compressing working capital cycles, around expanding asset terms, variety of companies, examples I gave you. And thirdly, uh, 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 it's been around the, around the benefits derived from uh, an inflationary uh, inflationary uh, cost pressure um, uh, on the raw material side, right? So uh, for an Asian paint, right? For an Asian paint, raw material costs went up significantly, right? Two quarters ago. What an Asian paint did not do is an Asian paint didn't say that, uh, uh, look, I will hike uh, my product prices by 20, 30% overnight. They said, let me take gradual price hikes, right? By taking gradual price hikes, obviously one, I will not destroy the demand overnight uh, because demand can be price elastic to an extent. But more importantly, by hiking prices gradually, let me uh, uh, protect my margin through incremental operating efficiency so that I don't have to hike prices uh, beyond a point. And if that is the approach, then competition, which cannot derive similar operating efficiencies, will be under pressure because if, if the market leader is not hiking prices enough, the competition has to live with the pricing pressure on the P&L, uh, which becomes more of a permanent issue, right? And hence, the market share gains, uh, hence the weakening of competition uh, significantly happens. And the Asian Paints was just an example. In variety of stocks, this has been a benefit, just like Saurabh talked about how in an inflationary environment, high quality companies, they actually increase their outperformance vis-a-vis uh, mediocre companies. So these are the reasons, and uh, and uh, that's the summary for CCP. I'll I'll hand over to Ashwin now to take you through uh, uh, his portfolios. Thank you, thank you, Rakshit. So I'll cover the rising tides portfolio first. Uh, so just to reiterate, you know, uh, similar to consistent compounders, we are also looking at the uh, free cash flow compounding in rising tides. And as we you know explained in our in our uh, January uh, uh, webinar, uh, you know, the key two free. Uh, Exceptional free cash flow compounding in rising sites is uh, uh, there are three legs. One is the uh, consistent growth in the operating profit. So as you can see in this uh, slide, 
So across different time periods in the last 10 years, uh, we have seen that uh, the EBITDA column, there is a very healthy growth in uh, the uh, operating profits. And especially in FI 18 to 21 period also, where you know there were a lot of macro challenges, even if during that period, the rising giants uh, companies have been able to maintain very good uh, healthy operating profit growth thanks to the market share gains, thanks to their capital allocation decisions. They have been able to maintain healthy operating profit growth. But also what has added over and above the operating profit growth is the reduction in the working capital. Again, we had explained that in detail, but just to cover it briefly, the driver of the working capital reduction has been uh, because these companies' dominance have been increasing their market shares, have been increasing. They're able to actually extract better uh, working capital days, both from their customers as well as from their vendors because the size is increasing. So that has contributed uh, firstly. And secondly, because of the investment into technology by these companies, especially in the back end, you know, in a better production planning systems, uh, IoT, automation, et cetera, we have seen uh, the inventory days coming off for most of the rising giants companies. So combination of these two, the working capital days, just to give some example, uh, between FI18 and an FI21 period, the working capital days at the portfolio level has come down by almost 10 days which has contributed to the delta that you see 17% and 33% in the last, last part. And also as these companies have increased in their size, uh, the absolute increase in the capital expenditure, while it, the absolute amount of capital expenditure remains high, but the, there is the absolute the growth in the uh, absolute capex, it is lesser than that of the growth in the operating profits. So as a result, more and more operating profits are actually uh, are flowing into the free cash flow compounding. So as a result, because of these three, operating profit continue to remain very healthy, a working capital reduction, and the the uh, the growth in the uh, capex lagging that of the growth in the operating profit means that we are seeing an exceptional phase of free cash flow compounding for the rising giants companies. So as you can see, forty one percent for the last three years, and we believe that you know this uh, phase will continue for many years for the rising giants companies. So this is the core theme and coming uh, now to the near term you know, results. So sort of you can scroll down one more slide. Uh, the operating profit growth <coughs> or the PBT growth has only accelerated in the last nine months. So as you can see that in the red dotted circle, uh, that the portfolio level, we are looking at a very healthy compounding uh, or growth, 28% at the weighted average and median 34% in the nine months. And this is again what you know actually talked about CCP companies, similar is the case for rising as companies. Uh, through this crisis, uh, the companies have actually accelerated their market share expansion. They have invested in capacities. We have seen a lot of consolidation, a uh, so lot of acquisitions uh, by the rising giants companies in the last one, one and a half years. And that, that has actually uh, led to an acceleration in the earnings growth that you can see in the last uh, nine months. Uh, and I can talk about companies. Sort of just one slide uh, uh, about. I'll just give you some example. For example, uh, uh, yeah, for example, GMF folder, you know, you can see a very strong growth in the PBT column thanks to the acquisition of uh, DDPS, uh, thanks to the acquisition of its global parent. You'll see that there's a massive growth in the uh, the PBT column. Uh, similarly, Astel has been helped by the acquisitions uh, uh, that it did or ex poly, etc. in the last two years. Uh, similarly, Suprajit is uh, gaining a lot of market share in the cables division because the weaker peers are going down by the wayside. So there is a massive market share expansion which has been witnessed. So as a result, we have seen uh, the uh, PBT growth only accelerating in the last nine months. Uh, in the third quarter, you'll find that there are some uh, companies which are showing figures in the red, but these are all near-term issues. So there are two near-term issues. I'll cover it off. Uh, one is that there is some supply-related supply related challenges faced by some companies. For example, container availability is a challenge. Uh, uh, so as a result, uh, for example, uh, or semiconductor is a is a challenge for some companies. So as a result, you find that, for example, Suprajit, uh, the PPT column, uh, because in its Europe business, uh, there is a semiconductor issue. Similarly, alkyl amines, uh, there is a very huge demand for its product. But the problem is there is some intermediates uh, which comes from China, which go into the end user industry products. So that is because of the container problem. Currently, there is a shortage of that raw material. Similarly, Galaxy, for example, was facing some challenges in the uh, availability of some raw material. But these are all transient issues. As the COVID situation is abating, we are seeing an improvement on this front. So more and more commentary is uh, pointing towards an improvement in this uh, container shortage issue. 
Second is the raw material uh, inflation, which has taken place. Again, this is purely a short-term uh, phenomenon because there is a lag in passing off, passing of the uh, increase in the raw material prices and the the passing of the same to the end user customers. So generally, there is a one quarter to two quarter lag. Uh, but again, you know, uh, uh, we think that you know this should be passed. The inflation that has happened in steel prices, aluminium prices, etc., that should be passed on in the coming quarters. Uh, the management commentary also pointed towards that. Similarly, going by the uh, the uh, uh, the historical margin trend of these companies, they have always been very very successful in passing of the uh, raw material inflation. Uh, uh, so, uh, and for most of these companies, it is also inbuilt into the customer agreement. So it is not that you know it's actually the raw material inflation is covered by the customer agreements. And also, what gives us confidence is that. Uh, uh, these companies are all market leaders, right? So they will be able to pass on that uh, increase in the raw material price. And third comfort about raw material price is the demand environment remains very, very uh, robust. Whether we are talking about surfactants, whether we are talking about PVC pipes, whether we are talking about passenger vehicles, for example, there is a long order waiting. So the demand is also very robust and that also gives us confidence that these companies will be able to pass on the raw material inflation. So net net, there is some uh, uh, blip in the third quarter result for some companies, but we strongly believe that these are temporary blips, and uh, the margin should normalize in the coming quarters. And also to look at positivity, rather positively, uh, as Rachid said, you know, great companies actually make good use of the crisis. So most of the peers of these companies are they are operating on wafer thin margins. So while these companies have healthy double digit margin, they have surplus cash on the balance sheet, they have very high ROC they will be actually able to absorb these near-term issues on the margin much of, of the inflation much better compared to the compared to their weaker peers. And hence, we believe that, in fact, this crisis is structurally near-term, maybe some negative impact, but structurally, this raw material inflation, uh, shortages raw material actually is beneficial, structurally beneficial for these companies and actually can help them accelerate the market share even more in the coming, coming uh, years. Uh, so yeah, that's it. I think uh, 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 I will. Uh, so these are all the reinvestment initiatives. Actually, we have covered this in detail in the last webinar, so we'll not then spend time. So I'll hand over to Tej now for the KCP portfolio. Thanks, Ashwin. So if you look at uh, the financial companies, uh, like Rakshit also highlighted uh, in uh, one of the earlier slides, the loan book growth uh, is pretty healthy when you look at. Uh, sequential numbers. So if you analyze the loan book growth for the latest quarter, uh, you can see that those numbers are healthy. Now, uh, even if you look at YOI numbers uh, for all of these companies, they suggest that there is massive market share improvement. Uh, and if you were to look at what the industry is growing at, it's at around 6-7% uh, uh, YOI loan book growth. If you were to look at uh, the sequential loan book growth for the industry, again, it's 2-3% uh, versus for our companies, for the lenders in our portfolio, we're looking at uh, almost twice that number in terms of loan book growth. So whatever sequential numbers that we can see on this slide, uh, it's a matter of time that this is translated into YOI loan book growth. So we are expecting to see 25-30% sort of YOI numbers uh, over the 40, over the coming few quarters. Uh, not only is it encouraging to see that the growth is coming through, but also NPA numbers for a lot of our lenders have returned to pre-COVID levels. Uh, so if you were to look at net NPA numbers, they're back to pre-COVID levels. Um, that is reflected in the profitability growth number, which is well about 20% for most of these companies. Um, and when it comes to uh, uh, the capital efficiency, return on assets, return on equity, uh, there is one table which we used to always discuss when it comes to lenders that during a crisis, uh, these lenders see an increase in NPS, no matter how good the lender is. But over the next two to five years, then metrics uh, start improving, which is whether it be NPA, whether it be market share gains, whether it be ROEs. So for the likes of, say, HDFC Bank, Vedat Finance, we're seeing that, Chola, et cetera, we're seeing that uh, the ROE numbers that these uh, companies are reporting, they are better than even the pre-COVID level numbers. Uh, these are actually numbers that they've never reported uh, in the past five years, 10 years. 
Uh, when it comes to the non-lenders, again, we are seeing uh, very healthy market share gains uh, for uh, the insurance companies. We are seeing uh, 20% sort of growth for life insurance. We are seeing around uh, 19 to 20% growth uh, for even ICAs and Lombard uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we believe that in a rising interest rate environment, uh, financial companies are even better positioned high quality financial companies are even better positioned than uh, their competitors and this market share gain acceleration uh, will be aided by uh, the strong capital adequacy um, and also the conservatism that these companies have displayed on asset quality so so folks uh, we'll open it up to Questions. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take the questions. So just keep putting it in the Q and A box. I'll take them from there, and uh, and we'll keep uh, pointing the questions towards uh, towards our fund managers. Um, um, uh, let me start with the question that you know lots of you uh, ask both on these calls and. Uh, and they come. These questions also come to us via email. Uh, the question, you know, the most commonly asked question is why do we take fifty lakhs as a minimum, right? Uh, so we appreciate that fifty lakhs for the vast majority of Indians, fifty lakhs is a lot of money. But that's the SEBI minimum. The, the rule from the regulator says we cannot open up a, 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 a PMS portfolio with less than less than 50 lakhs of, uh, of corpus. And therefore, you know, you'll have to excuse us there. We are trying to figure out if there's something that we can do for people who can't, who can't invest 50 lakhs. It's work in progress, but uh, SEBI's rules are very clear. We cannot open a PMS a portfolio for, for less than 50 lakhs. So please excuse us. It's a regulatory requirement. It's not something that we have uh, foisted upon you. So Tej, we'll start with you. So uh, Anand is asking, uh, he wants to understand what is ICICI Lombard's comparative advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis its competition. He's referencing you know, HDFC, Ergo and Bajaj Alliance, but generally if you can help the audience understand where ICICI Lombard stands out. So ICICI Lombard has historically demonstrated strength in a couple of aspects, uh, uh, which is far better than competition. One is that uh, over the last 10 years, they've been able to grow profits at 20% plus in an industry where the overall profit pool has actually declined over this 10 year period. The way they've been able to do this is they've been able to manage uh, uh, the segments that they operate in uh, based on the profit pool available in that segment. So for example, when say the fire segment does well, uh, they have a keen eye on the bottom line. Uh, when the fire segment does well, they become aggressive in the fire segment. When say motor as a segment starts doing well, they've switched to the motor segment. So they've been very agile, very nimble when it comes to selection of segments, selection of the subsectors that they operate in. Uh, while if you look at most of the competitors, uh, they've grown uh, at uh, decent rates when it comes to top line, but the focus on bottom line, focus on profitability and return on equity um, has not been so much. Uh, secondly, uh, the reason that ICIC Lombard has been able to do this is because they have been the leaders across segments when it comes to distribution, when it comes to reach. So whether it be motor, they are present across all OEMs, whether it be corporate, that is uh, fire, marine, uh, property, casualty, etc. They are uh, the number one in terms of market share. Uh, and similarly, uh, when it comes to availability of ICIC Lombard across most hospitals, they are one of the highest in terms of distribution reach. So this has enabled ICIC Lombard uh, to grow profitably, which is the most important aspect in a general insurance company rather than focusing only on uh, top line market share. Okay. So let me just do one more admin question, Rakshit, and I'll come to you with the inevitable question about oil and uh, 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 operating margins of Asian Baja Petalite. Um, so, Partha, you're asking that, you know, the U.S. office is open for business. Yes, that's true. Marcellus has opened an office in New York. Uh, you're saying that you registered by email link, but you didn't get a response. Uh, if you could just type in your email address, Partha, in this, uh, in this uh, Q&A box, uh, we'll request our salespeople to, uh, to do the needful. Uh, Surakshit, uh, anonymous attendee asks, uh, Russia-Ukraine war crude price likely to rise. So I presume he's figured out, anonymous, anonymous, anonymous attendees figured out that Russia-Ukraine war will lead to crude going up. Then he's asking, well, won't this lead to raw material cost and be negative for Asian Berger and Pedalite? Rakshit. Sure. So uh, let me just answer that using 
uh, using historical evidence uh, uh, and data. So let me share my screen. Uh, right, so here uh, you can see, uh, you can see what happened to, uh, to crude oil prices over the last five years. I can't see how I can uh, increase the duration of the chart to maybe 15 years. You'll see more cycles in a 15 year period, but let me, let me take the last five years. Right, so uh, so this is somewhere in the in the middle of 2017 where crude was at 45, and whatever be the reason, I don't know the reason. Uh, I don't remember the reason. Uh, it went up to 80, 80, right? From 45, it went up to 80 uh, uh, between mid 17 to to mid 19, right? And then uh, from early 20 uh, to uh, to sort of uh, early 22, it has already gone up from. From uh, from thirty dollars to something like eighty ninety dollars, right? Uh, now let's just see what impact it had on the on the financials. So this is Asian Paints. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, just focus on the relevant line items. Uh, this is the EBITDA margin, uh, right? Uh, uh, between middle of two thousand seventeen, which was FY eighteen, and, and end of two thousand nineteen, which was sort of FY FY nineteen end. Uh, there was actually there's, you don't see any 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 changes here, right? Uh, in fact, from from FY20 to FY21, you don't see any changes. In fact, you see the margin improving, right? Uh, so why is it why is it that there is no impact on on the annual uh, EBITDA margins of an Asian paint despite crude doing yo-yoing? Uh, uh, if you look at quarterly, you'll get the answer. So when you look at quarterly. Uh, just check out the check out the margins here, uh, right? So, uh, hang on, let me let me tell you which which year is what. This is FY20, this is FY19, and 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 this this one is FY FY18. You can see here uh, when crude uh, crude prices started going up, right? There was a there was a moderation from 18 percent. It went down to 16. Again, when crude prices started going up. Uh, there was a bit of moderation here, and especially uh, uh, early 2020 uh, crude oil prices started going up. So you saw the 22% going down to 17. That's a five percentage point moderation. Uh, but then uh, things recovered. So on a quarterly basis, for a couple of percentage, a uh, couple of quarters, you will certainly see compression, right? So so it's a five percentage point compression here. Uh, in some other quarters, it will be it will be more. Uh, global financial crisis had a much bigger volatility, and hence the quarterly margins uh, they they jagged around a lot more, right? But in annual numbers, you don't see the effect because of the simple reason that a high pricing power company, what it does is it says that uh, that rather than protecting my margin in the short term, if I can protect my margin over a 12 month rolling period by minimizing the shock to the customer and at the same time by increasing the pressure on competition, then why not do that, right? That's exactly what Asian Paints has done. So the September quarter for Asian Paints saw a massive margin slide. September 2021 quarter saw a massive uh, EBITDA margin slide. Uh, we, are, we are more than two thirds of the way through from that margin slide in the December quarter. Uh, and I think in the next one or two quarters, you'll see the pricing power play out. And over a 12 month rolling, uh, 12, 12 month rolling period, the, the margins will not have any any significant volatility attached to them related to crude, right? Um, again, just relating to, I, I saw another question on the same subject uh, that that uh, we've written in the past uh, that uh, uh, consistent compounders and uh, and uh, little champs and all of these companies they avoid price hikes to to increase their competitive advantages. Uh, if that is the case, then uh, then avoiding price hikes won't it uh, be detrimental uh, during a uh, during a, a, a raw material inflationary environment. So, so let me put some things into context. So, um, you would avoid price hikes to put competition under pressure if there was need to hike prices. If there is no need to hike prices, then avoiding price hikes won't help you beat your competition better, right? The greater the need to hike prices, the bigger the advantage by avoiding price hikes to an extent, right? And hence, that's where in effect, Saurabh's, uh, uh, one of the slides which showed how high quality companies, they expand their outperformance, fundamental outperformance, vis-a-vis -vis competition during raw material inflationary uh, environment. 
uh, it it naturally plays out what high quality companies do is they say that look if raw material cost inflation requires us to increase product prices by let's say 10 percentage points in order to protect against margin compression then instead of hiking prices by 10% we will actually hike prices by 5 or 6% right why because that way we will be able to rely on our operating efficiency then still protect margins and hence we don't need a 10% hike but if our competition doesn't have the same operating efficiencies then the competition will be uh, will be under a lot of pressure on profitability and hence cash generation and hence growth eventually because they can't hike prices by more than 5 or 6%, right? Uh, so that's how it plays out. Um, and hence, the, the greater the volatility in raw material costs, the greater the alpha of uh, fundamental performance between a high quality player and a, and a low quality player. So let me take a couple of ad admin questions and then we'll, we'll go to Tej Tej. Uh, the question I'll come to you with, several people are asking about different parts of the HDFC group. So if you could just uh, do an omnibus answer, uh, a lot of people realize that HDFC group actually is doing splendidly, whether it is a uh, life bank or indeed the, 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 pay, the limited, which we're, where we're not invested. So they're a little perplexed. Ki share price kyun chalta hai if everything is going hunky dory and the inevitable question, therefore, the, why, why haven't you bought ICICI bank? So, so just think about that. Let me quickly take a couple of admin questions. So Nitin Jain is saying, I have investment in all three RGP, uh, Rising Giants, Consistent Compounders, Kings of Capital. He says, I'm sitting on a loss of 10% overall. If I plan to top up, money will again go into the same stocks. Absolutely, Nitin, we do the same thing year after year, day after day. We don't really lose that much sleep. Ki Ukraine ho hai, ya oil price is going up or what is the Federal Reserve doing? We do the same thing, which is clean companies, well-managed well companies, good capital allocation, and, and uh, dominant franchises, high pricing power, right? And um, that's what we do. That's what we'll carry on doing. So therefore, by definition, our portfolios are very little churn. Uh, as you must have heard from us, we don't try to time the market. Um, uh, you will compound at the rate at which the portfolios, the underlying portfolio companies' cash flows are compounding. As my colleagues showed you, uh, broadly speaking, uh, without getting into specifics of rising giants or CCP or KCP, the underlying portfolios are compounding at 20, 25%. And that gives you a pretty good steer at the rate at which your money will compound. Uh, and that's we, so, so we not just for you, for the remaining 7,500 clients, including everybody on the screen from Marcellus, who's, who are also Marcellus clients, uh, many of their parents, my parents are Marcellus clients, uh, several of the people on the screen, their parents are Marcellus clients, their wives are Marcellus clients. Um, so for you, for, for everybody who's listening, for our parents, for our families, we'll carry on doing the same old, same old. Uh, we're not going to suddenly go out and buy metals and mining stocks or telecom stocks or real estate developers or, you know, what other crazy things could we do? So anyway, none of those crazy things will be done. Same old, same old. Chalta rehega. Uh, and uh, and this is what works in India. This is what makes money. We've written about it in books which sell by the lakhs. So 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 the same old uh, performance continues. Um, so Tej, over to you on on uh, uh, HDFC uh, ICICI. Uh, uh. Yeah. So if you look at uh, the performance of HDFC Bank, I've covered off HDFC uh, group companies and uh, ICICI. Uh, HDFC Bank uh, over the last. Uh, th Two or three years, we showed the fundamental data. Last two year, uh, uh, loan book growth 16%. If you extend that time horizon to three years, uh, that's about 19, 20%. If you extend it to five years, that's about 19, 20%. Uh, during this time, uh, the loan book growth uh, for the industry as a whole, for the banking industry as a whole, uh, has been anywhere between uh, six to 10% at best. So over the past three years, HDFC Bank has gained about two and a half to three percent market share. Uh, profits during the past one year, three year, five years have grown at twenty percent. Twenty percent kegar over three years and five years, and even during the past year, they've grown at about seventeen, eighteen percent. So uh, fundamentally, HDFC Bank has added uh, uh, about over the past three years two and a half lakh crores to three lakh crores in loan book which is equal to a Kotak bank. So fundamentally, HDFC bank is doing extremely well. Now, uh, it, it might well happen that the share price does not perform, say, for three more months, six more months, but it is very difficult to believe, as we have shown in uh, all of our data crunches, that over a long period of time, 
for lenders, share price performance is equal to uh, earnings growth. Uh, it is very difficult to believe that a company keeps on delivering 20% earnings growth um, and share price performance uh, lags behind. Uh, now coming to HDFC Life, HDFC Life, exactly same story over the past uh, one year, two year, three years, five years, have grown premiums at uh, 18 to 19%. Uh, during the same period of time, uh, life insurance industry has grown at at least six to seven percent, uh, uh, six to seven percentage points lower than what HDFC Life has grown at. HDFC Life has also added three uh, percent uh, to its market share, which uh, being the largest private life insurer is again a massive deal. It's added maybe a couple of smaller insurers to itself over the past couple of years itself. Um, and again, uh, during this period of time, EV growth, ROEV, all operating metrics are extremely healthy. So again, uh, very difficult to believe that it keeps on growing at 80 to 20 percent um, and share prices do not move in line with fundamentals. So uh, uh, we need to keep a focus on how the fundamentals are behaving. And uh, as we have shown, uh, the share price performance should follow. When it comes to ICIC Bank, uh, what we've seen of ICICI Bank is, and the result, and the, re the reason that it does not uh, clear any of our filters is that over the past 10 years, 5 years, 10 years, 12 years, ICICI Bank has not delivered ROEs of more than 15%. It's delivered ROEs of more than 15%, I think, twice in the past 12 years. Uh, so uh, that's the reason it's not uh, cleared our filters so far. However, we'll be doing more work on ICICI Bank. As long as they keep on delivering this consistent performance, which they have over the past year or uh, year and a half, uh, uh, we'll keep doing more work on them and see whether it fits into our portfolios or not. Thanks, Tej. Uh, so, Rakshit, uh, uh, a lot of eagle-eyed clients have spotted that your slide pe Nestle nahi tha. So, so if you could just give uh, the, the verbal overlay on on Nestle, right? But why still think about that 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 operational operational omission ki Nestle nahi tha, and why still reassure people ye koi Freudian slip nahi hai? Uh, uh, Ashwin, a question for you: Why are second tier IT companies not in LCP and uh, and uh, uh, rising giants? Right? Very cleverly worded question, Ashwin. Why are second tier IT services companies not in LCP and rising giants? Yeah, yeah. so I will start and uh, since we have Salil, I'll uh, request Salil also to add. So primarily, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, one reason is that uh, uh, I think uh, a lack of uh, consistency in the free cash flow generation. So most of the, uh, I think, second tier, we find that while they are delivering good on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the top line, as well as to some extent on the army's growth, but the free cash flow generation is, uh, uh, I think, uh, non-existent. I think uh, that is one. Uh, secondly, obviously, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, there is lack of moat in those companies. Uh, by definition, they are competing against the, you know, the top uh, names in the IT uh, industry. Uh, so we believe that, you know, uh, lack of pricing power, or rather, there is no significant uh, uh, competitive advantages uh, in those companies. Uh, I think that is what I think. Uh, Sully, you want to add anything on that? Uh, so you're right, Ashwin. Uh, so one is uh, for LCP specifically, uh, you know, none of these IT companies would actually uh, had made the cut back then because uh, they weren't of uh, a size which would fit into LCP. In RGB, in fact, have uh, an IT, a quasi-IT services company, an engineering services company, follow almost a similar uh, model. Uh, and why they are not there is, like Ashwin said, uh, there is no differentiation in what uh, what they do versus the large guys. So there is, we, would, we are seeing actually cases of consolidation in this space and uh, the larger companies would uh, uh, end up being beneficiaries of this. Uh, so that's that's the broad reasons why uh, you wouldn't see too many IT services companies, either in LCP or in RG. Akshit, Nestle. Sure. So, um, a very interesting. Somebody pointed that out, and I noticed actually uh, we, we the only reason was that the slide was prepared when Nestle's results were not yet out, and it was the last from the report results. No other, no other reason of hiding transparency or or anything like that. Um, so, so Nestle is very much a high conviction uh, stock in our portfolio. We keep holding on to it, and uh, and its uh, its revenues uh, have grown at around uh, uh, sort of low double digit over the last. Uh, uh, not just couple of years, uh, but even uh, even over the last uh, four or five years, 
Um, why we are not uh, why we are not concerned about a relatively lower rate of growth of revenues, uh, which is low double digit, uh, 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 sort of uh, 11, 12, 13 um, percent. The main reason is because the, the 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 drivers of low double digit revenue growth are portfolio uh, portfolio rationalization that the company is uh, is adopting. So, um, uh, if you remember uh, five six years ago. Uh, Nestle used to uh, uh, emphasize, advertise a lot on 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 certain categories, such as say the the, uh, the there was the A plus the he the naturals, then uh, there was the milk milkmaid, there was uh, uh, there was a bunch of other things uh, like sauces and all, um, which were all uh, which were all uh, 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 sort of getting investment of the company uh, into, uh, into delivering growth, et cetera. But these were all categories where competitive advantages of Nestle were relatively weak, uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, their better quality peers. And hence, uh, uh, Nestle has, uh, uh, in our understanding, Nestle has started to rationalize on the, on the portfolio construct, right? Uh, uh, there, there are certain products where, uh, margins were weaker, uh, but they were still contributing to revenues. Uh, uh, they have been de-emphasized in uh, in the co uh, company's investments behind uh, behind where the growth in future will be derived from and there are certain other products uh, such as say noodles in particular uh, where where significant investments have been made uh, because there there the competitive advantages are stronger the margins are better as a result of this whilst you don't see the top line uh, growing at a very healthy pace the bottom line has actually continued to grow at a at a remarkable pace right uh, there's a there's a good one and a half to two percentage point annual mar annualized margin expansion over the five six years uh, over the last five six years, and that has uh, that has then uh, translated into profit after tax compounding at uh, at above twenty percent, and uh, uh, more interestingly, free cash flows, uh, free cash flows because Nestle has heavily started sweating the assets harder uh, at its manufacturing plants. There's, there are massive upgrades of processes and systems. Uh, that they're doing in their in their manufacturing plants, and there's there's a lot of compression uh, of working capital that is that is uh, being attempted here because of which free cash flow compounding at Nestle has been uh, has been reasonably healthy, especially over the period of FY17 to 21, uh, if you really see. So, so we're not uh, not worried at all, and uh, and and uh, the company is doing actually very well. Okay, so so Sanil, I'll put a question to you, which I think a lot of people uh, would benefit from. Uh, I I know I'm, I appreciate that on this call there are three chartered accountants, so I could go to any three of them. But let me go to Sanil because he's written a book on this subject called Diamonds in the Dust. So the question Anand Anand Jain asks Sanil is, can you share how you go about forensic accounting, and can you cite some examples of how pitfalls are avoided uh, by the team at Marcellus? Sure. So, so in fact, uh, disclaimer before that is that uh, a lot of the forensic work, the groundwork was done by Ashwin. So, so Ashwin, please feel free to step in if uh, you think there's more value add to be uh, to be done. Uh, right. So, uh, there are there are uh, you know, two three ways in which we do this. The first is uh, uh, a filter that we. Like a mic. Okay. Right. Right. Yes. Right. So first is, uh, you know, we have a filter, uh, uh, you know, which, uh, like I've seen, Ashwin has uh, laid the foundations of. So this filter uh, uses a set of about a dozen accounting ratios, uh, which we apply to uh, a series of companies. So let's say if it's the BSC 500, so on 500 stocks, we apply these filters, right? These are relative filters in the sense that we rank the companies on these accounting parameters or the forensic ratios, the results of these forensic ratios. And we select the ones which are uh, uh, in the top five or six percentiles, right? These are the ones which have relatively better quality of accounting or reported financials. Uh, so this becomes the first step and the short list. So companies which pass, uh, pass this filtering criteria uh, and have also other financial parameters which you know fit well into our investment approach. Uh, you all know about that uh, growth ROCE. Right, and, uh, history of capital location and so on. Uh, and then once we select which companies uh, are worth spending more time on, the ones which have clear accounting quality and capital location filters, uh, we do qualitative checks. Right? Qualitative checks would be something say as simple as who sits on the company's board. Right? Is the board sufficiently independent? Uh, uh, are the qualified people sitting on the board? Right? Uh, or things like where, uh, uh, what is the extent of related party transactions in this company? 
you know how much are they paying auditors how much how many times have auditors been rotated in the sense that two auditors come and resign in a couple of years and then a new uh, in a new firm comes in and so on so series of qualitative checks to figure out that is that something we need to really worry about uh, once this stage passes is then we try and do what we call as primary data checks so we'll try and uh, talk to people associated with the companies do a reference check on on the management on the promoters uh, get a sense of their background a uh, look at history uh, if there are you know multiple listed companies of the same group we try and see if there has been something you know some some hanky panky which has gone through some transactions which have escaped the accounts right uh, so there could be uh, uh, transaction on the stock market you know, which might try to raise uh, certain red flags uh, it is a combination of all of this is when eventually we build conviction that yes the numbers told us something the qualitative checks either confirmed or uh, you know repudiated what was what the numbers were telling us and once we have confidence on that is when we say that okay this company has cleared our uh, governance and accounting forensic checks uh, and if everything else falls in place then maybe it's uh, right for that company to be part of the portfolio so that's largely the the, the process thanks sir thank you now ashwin anything you want to add on accounting fraud given that you, you do run little champs and you run run rising giants uh, i think we have uh, specified the uh, uh, ratios in the uh, in the book but broadly speaking you know uh, i think uh, where the pnl of a company uh, tells a different story and the balance sheet and the cash flow statements tell a different story uh, for example pnl uh, gives a very rosy picture uh, but when you look at the cash flow statement there is no free cash flow generation balance sheet mein bahut sara debt hai i think uh, that is a very good indicator that there is something uh, amiss in the company similarly where there is a lot of equity dilution which is happening in the company at regular intervals related parties hai aur is a transactions bhi bahut ho raha hai i think that is and la- lastly i think where the company is uh, not performing great but uh, where the promoter's lifestyle doesn't suggest so so i think that also is a very good indicator broadly speaking you know uh, to detect fraudulent companies thanks so rakshit i'll give you a question yeah you might want to sort of uh, fire up fire up uh, some of the intellectual property to answer tanmay mohata's uh, uh, you know well well thought through question so he's saying that look firstly you mentioned that pe doesn't play a very crucial role whilst investing in the wrong run and and he cites this excel this excel spreadsheet that we used to explain that if a company compounds its cash flow at 25% for the next 25 years its fair value pe is near to 280 absolutely right tanmay and by the way anybody watching feel free to do this at home this is not a this is not going to hurt you just open up an excel compound the company's cash flows at 25% for 25 years as then as done assume that the cost of capital is say cost of equity is around 12 13% and you'll see that company is indeed worth 280 times as uh, then mai mohata is saying so then mai goes on to say i was curious to know how do you evaluate when a company whether a company will be able to sustain their present cash flows over the next 25 years that absolutely right then mai is the big question that fund managers are paid to answer the fund managers are not paid to answer crude ka price kahan jayega is saal ka compounding kya hoga up election ka result kya hoga that's not the fund manager's job as then mai has beautifully put it the main thing that the fund manager is supposed to uh, figure out for his clients is how long will the current healthy compounding sustain is it 5 years is it 15 years is it 25 years so rakshit uh, 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 if you can help uh, the audience understand how exactly we do this across our portfolios sure so um uh, very good question tanne uh, look uh, the way uh, the way we uh, we we go through building conviction on longevity right and as you rightly said longevity is actually a bigger source of undervaluation in uh, in the share prices of high quality companies not so much uh, not so much just the uh, uh, just the rate of growth so let me project a slide uh, which many of you would have seen in the past uh, so this is a this is a research framework right so i'll talk you through how we how we build conviction on sustainability over a over a very long term future uh, for a company's cash flows uh, there can be sustainability based on two types of risk that the company avoids right what, what is what is sustainability really like uh, if you can avoid risk of uh, risk of let's say competition uh, uh, risk of uh, 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 a macro event or a disruption or uh, evolution in the uh, uh, underlying uh, 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 ecosystem for a business 
right? If you can avoid the risk of uh, management changes and hence decision making quality getting diluted, right? Uh, if you can avoid the risk of scale becoming a complexity for a business to manage uh, as an institution, etc. Right? Those are the risks. If you can avoid the risks, then the longevity increases. If you can't avoid the risks, then certainly you cannot you cannot say that a, a company will keep compounding cash flows at a certain rate beyond the next say three to five years, right? Which then becomes a very short foreseeable future, right? Um, now, how do we assess uh, 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 how the the risks can be mitigated uh, by a company in building longevity uh, conviction in our mind? First and foremost, it's about the capital allocation decision making, right? Uh, around three aspects. Now, this is, uh, remember, this is capital which has already been allocated in the last two to three years. We are not talking about capital which is yet to be allocated. We're talking about initiatives which have already been uh, been kicked off by the company, right? So we want to see what has, what has an Asian paint done in the last two, three years, which will lead to its supply chain efficiencies become better in 2025 compared to 2022, right? That, uh, will give us a conviction on incremental deepening of existing modes of an uh, of a nation paints of a Dr. Lal of a Bajaj finance so on and so forth. Right? Uh, uh, if we don't see this, then there is a there is a high possibility there is a high possibility that competition will catch up with the uh, with the offering of our portfolio company, and hence uh, the competitive advantage will erode and the longevity will be curtailed. Right, so that's one layer. The second layer is we want to see how new revenue growth items and new revenue growth drivers are getting added to the business. Right, this has to be uh, through areas where returns on capital employed remains very high even in the new revenue growth drivers. Right, um, for this we want to again see tangibly in the last two, three, four years where capital has been allocated to to ensure that Dr. Lal Path Labs is not just a diagnostic company. Uh, that to just North India based. We want to see where Titan is not just a jeweler, uh, Asian Paints is not just a paint company, a Pedialyte is not just an adhesive company, a Bajaj Finance is not just a lender. We want to see these companies add new revenue growth drivers that increases the longevity, right? That ensures that saturation of your core doesn't become a constraint. That also ensures that by having five uh, peripheral different revenue growth drivers, which all interplay with each other, is a deeper moat with greater longevity than just one single one single product, right? So if, if Asian Paints has got uh, paint, on top of it, it has got waterproofing, and then it has wallpapers, and then it has uh, uh, the, the sort of sleek and SS acquisitions, and through that it is it is getting into newer categories further, then a combination of all of this uh, plays to the benefit of just paint itself as well, right? So it deepens the existing competitive advantage further. It adds adds beyond just the saturation risk uh, to the longevity, right? Uh, the third bit is we want to see how our portfolio companies are actually disrupting their industry rather than getting disrupted by by uh, competition or new new age competition as they call it, right? In future, um, combination of this gives us uh, defense against. Uh, uh, defense against uh, competition available to our portfolio companies, uh, defense against evolution, disruption, so on and so forth. That adds to several years of longevity. We have a we have a way to quantify this internally. Uh, obviously, we can't. Uh, it's it's a uh, it, it, it's it's going to be a long exercise taking you through those through that. And then there is a succession plan, a softer aspect, right? And a combination of all of these factors then tells us that look, the risks involved are lower. And hence, it's not just a five-year compounding of free cash flow that we need to bake in. It's a much longer uh, uh, rate of uh, duration of free cash flow compounding, which then gives the intrinsic value a massive jump. So, Hook, sir, let me then take this opportunity to ask, uh, uh, to answer uh, 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 lots of questions which are of the same theme, right? I think what, what's happened to a lot of people is they believe that Investing somehow is a link to timing the PE multiple. So a lot of people believe a lot of people believe that the fund manager somehow has the hand of God on his head and will miraculously time the PE multiple. Now, obviously, that can't happen, right? Unless and if somebody tells you they can time the PE multiple, 
uh, please request them to go and get a mental checkup because it can't be done. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, I've worked with some of the world's finest fund managers. Nahi hota pe multiple time. It's irrational to, to even claim that that's a re relevant way to invest. And linked to that is the notion that P multiple bad gaya hai. Uh, you know, the, uh, you, you must have heard for the last 20 years that Asian Paints' ka PE multiple for 20 years is looking like it's high. And yet the stock has given 160 fold in the last 20 years. Throughout, apparently, the PE multiple was high. So this sort of lunacy is common and hence, you know, we try to steer clear of it. Now, equally, uh, equally useless is speculation on what will happen to oil prices, what will happen to interest rates. Somebody is asking China, if Taiwan ko invade kar diya, kya hoga? Right? Somebody else wants to know global warming hoga, to clean tech chalega kya. That form of investing is also is also also a futile activity. You're not gonna go very far if your investment speculates around intergalactic events. I mean, it's a good way to you know pass the time. It's like you know those people who know who bet on raindrops falling on a rainy day. Konsa raindrop jitega? Right? That's like a way some people pass their time. So so you might as well bet on raindrops uh, racing to the bottom of your window sill on a rainy day. If your style of investing is waiting for clean tech or war or interest rates or oil prices. So all of this stuff, this whole P multiple business, speculating on intergalactic events. The broad area is is called speculation. Uh, we are not here to speculate. We are managing the money of 8,000 families out there. Several of you on this call, we are managing your money. Our job is to compound your wealth. Now, linked to that is questions lots of you are asking, kitna paisa banega? Kya return aega? Compounding kitna aega? Right? Now, the simplest way to uh, figure it out yourself, and since remember, if you're a client, all of you have access to the portfolio. You can you can see the names of the stocks in the portfolio. So just to take an example, right? If you were to, if you, if you wanted yourself to figure out, how much will I compound in CCP at, right? So CCP this year, this current financial year from, <clears throat> from 1st April 2022 to now, CCP is compounded, I think, at around 16%, right? Now, how much will CCP compound in the next 12 months, right? Uh, I don't think Rakshit or I can sit here with a crystal ball and say, Lagda hai CCP mein saale sola aega, nahi hota hai you will compound at the same rate at which the underlying cash flows of the business compound, right? Over the last uh, 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 five years, over the last 10 years, over the last 15 years, right? You can see the compounding of these businesses. These businesses you can figure out compound at, say, for the sake of argument, roughly at 25%. Now, whether you invest in these businesses directly yourself through the good offices of the National Stock Exchange and the Bombay Stock Exchange, or you invest in these businesses via Marcellus's portfolios, you will compound at the rate of these cash flows. The PE multiple, China, Taiwan, Ukraine, Russia, oil prices, global warming are not relevant. They're not germane to the debate, right? If you want to do have a, have a punt, like a hobby investing thing, by all means, punt around that. But we're not here to do that. We're here to compound your wealth at the rate at which these underlying compound companies are compounding their cash flows, right? And, and that's why we did this presentation so that you can see that these businesses are compounding well, whether it is the CCP businesses where Rakshit showed you revenues are compounding at around 25%. Uh, 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 you know, you more data, the, the uh, 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 rising giants businesses where uh, Ashwin showed you that, that profits are compounding at say again, roughly the mid twenties. Uh, if you want to be, take the median figure, it's a little higher or the kings of capital businesses where, where they showed you that that the the the, the profits are again uh, growing at at pretty healthy rates right why why profit growth is back so your compounding will be broadly in the vicinity of <coughs> the underlying compounding of these businesses those numbers are becoming healthy uh, uh, post covid broadly mid 20s and that's what you'll get and that's what investing is about investing is not about second guessing the pe multiple or events of global global import uh, Tej, I'll come to you again. Several people are asking HDFC, AMC. Uh, why is it going down? You know, uh, what is Marcel is thinking about, about doing with AMC, HDFC, AMC, given that AUM Girai, some people believe AUM is falling for HDFC, AMC. So AUM is uh, growing for HDFC, AMC. Uh, it's grown at, uh, anywhere between over the last one year, three years, five years, again, anywhere between 15 to 20%. HDFC, AMC, over the last uh, two, three quarters, has lost market share. Uh, this market share loss has been a factor of a couple of things. Uh, they've lost market share first because there were a lot of NFOs which have come to the market. 
that has also resulted in a lot of AUM which is virtually earning no fees uh, uh, coming to the market. Uh, secondly, if you look at uh, HDFC AMC's uh, uh, mix of AUM, it's largely contributed by equities which earn one of the highest uh, sort of uh, fees on AUM. Their net profit to AUM number is one of the highest. So when it comes to say passives coming to the market or NFOs which earn almost nothing uh, coming to the market, uh, that number uh, sort of inflates the denominator for the industry. So industry AUM is inflated because a lot of passive flows, a lot of AUM from NFOs which won't earn a lot of money come to the market. That is one of the reasons that the market should losses there. Uh, uh, over the past year or so, HDFC AMC performance across all schemes has remarkably improved. Uh, their uh, performance for the largest schemes, which contribute about 70-80% of equity AUM, is uh, now uh, looking uh, in the top uh, quartile or so. So all their funds, uh, their performance has improved, which was also one of the reasons that they had earlier lost market share. Now, uh, what are the steps that HDFC AMC is taking uh, to uh, regain market share, uh, to start going back to 20% sort of AUM growth and therefore profit growth. A couple of things that they have done is uh, they have uh, 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 reduced their dependence on one style of investing. They've reduced their dependence on the few funds which used to contribute a large part of AUM. Uh, the second thing that they have done is uh, over a period of time, they want to improve their positioning in passives. They've launched about 12 to 13 passive funds over the past three to four months. Um, and their presence in passives over the next couple of years is going to remarkably in increase. So their visibility in passives is also going to contribute to AUM growth. Although that uh, AUM growth will have a lower yield, uh, but uh, the expansion in AUM, the growth in AUM, so we'll maybe compensate for that. Um, and thirdly, they were not present in a few parts uh, where a lot of new age uh, players have come in, which is a small case or uh, digital marketing is not something that HDFC MC had only have focused on. They're also, they've also started uh, doing that uh, uh, over the last couple of quarters. So uh, first uh, step, first step would be to gra see gradual reduction or arrest in uh, market share loss. Um, and then they'll start seeing maybe 15 to 20% growth in events. Uh, uh, Rakshit, uh, uh, some of the clients are asking this year in CCP, we have uh, we bought three stocks and we have sold three stocks. Um, so in a 14 stock portfolio, right? Three divided by 14, that's around a 20%, a 20% a, a a uh, churn ratio. What sort of churn ratio do you expect CCP to have in, in, in the longer term? Yeah, in the longer term, I, I think you should expect around, say, 8 to 10 percent in a year uh, because of uh, stock entry exit and uh, another, say, 4 to 5 percent a year because of rebalancing uh, uh, actions. The rebalancing activity is uh, either because of change in our conviction levels on stocks, which leads to changes to the model portfolio itself, or uh, dislocations emerging. Uh, which we try to benefit from, where a particular stock might rise a lot more or might fall a lot more than the rest of the portfolio, and we rebalance the portfolio to, to take advantage of that dislocation. So net-net, uh, 8 to 10 plus uh, 4 to 5, uh, total no more than 15% uh, churn in a year. Okay. Uh, Tej, coming back to you, so Daljeet Singh Ji is asking a, a specific question on Avas, Tej. So he's asking that, look, uh, Avas lends to non-salaried people. And uh, given that Avas lends at higher rates of interest than, say, uh, an HDFC bank would do. So given that Avas is lending to non-salaried people and given that non-salaried people have had a rough time through COVID, uh, how do we know that uh, you know Avas's credit quality has held up? How do we know that Avas indeed is doing a good job on, on, on credit quality? Uh, is there some specific method that you use to assess uh, Avas's uh, you know, touchy-feely type of lending to self-employed guys? Sure. So uh, it's important to understand that, yes, they do self-employed, but uh, the ticket size and the security or the collateral that they take for these type of loans is uh, the uh, residence, self-occupied residence of uh, the people that they are lending to. So average ticket size for Avas would be 9, 10 lakh rupees. And uh, this is done on the basis of about 50 to 60% LTVs. So there is a very high equity of the borrower uh, which is involved uh, in the loan itself. 
uh, because the borrower is borrowing against uh, his own home, which he is living in currently with his family. Uh, there is no uh, sort of uh, developer loan, builder loan, construction finance, which Avas does. Also, these are all uh, uh, properties which are already constructed and there is no funding against you know, land or uh, partially constructed houses, etc., which is all relatively riskier sort of lending. So yes, it is lending to self-employed uh, category of borrowers, but it is home loans. So say, uh, if you compare this to say lending to salaried uh, people with say HDFC Limited or any of the banks who do, uh, their NPAs through COVID on home loans have been uh, uh, very healthy. So the numbers for say, HDFC Limited were again on salaried home loans, uh, we 1% or less than 1% when it comes to NPS. So if we were to compare AWAS uh, to that sort of lending, AWAS's NPS would be maybe 20, 30 bips higher uh, than HDFC Limited, which is adjusting for uh, the class of borrowers that they lend to. Um, and they lend at 12, 13%. Uh, average lending rates for AWAS are 12, 13% versus say 7, 8% for prime salaried uh, home loans. Uh, which is good enough to cover for the extra credit cost that ours will incur. Thanks, Tej. Thank you. Um, uh, Dinesh Goyal is asking, what percentage of the master's team's personal wealth is invested in their own products? Do they eat their own dog food? I'm not so sure it's dog food, sir. I think you went to say, uh, and do they eat their own food? Skin in the game is critical. Uh, yes, it is. And we've got not just our skin in the game. Apna paisa to hai. Ka paisa bhi hai, wife ka paisa bhi hai. Uh, it's all in. Largely because it's very difficult to find this style of investing in India, right? As many of you are saying in your questions, uh, there's this bizarre view in India that you have to time macro events, koi favorable conditions, ko time karo, or look for low PE multiples. That's obviously nonsense. That doesn't work. And hence, actually, this is how Marshall has initially started out. It started out with uh, five years ago, us investing our own money. Uh, that led to the books, which led to us creating the business. Uh, so good question, Dinesh Goyalji. It's a good question. Everybody should ask their fund managers. How much of their personal wealth do they have invested in their portfolios? In our case, the answer is 100%. Um, lots of you are asking that rising giants may uh, flows. Uh, is it open for flows? Absolutely, rising giants is open for flows in a PMS avatar. Uh, the minimum is a crore. Several of you are asking the minimum to be reduced. No, folks, we won't do that. Uh, rising giants is a higher risk product. Uh, than CCT in two different ways. A, the liquidity of the portfolio is lower, which means that we can't just take money in and out uh, on a you know uh, on a free on a free flowing basis like we do with CCP. Because in CCP there is no liquidity challenges. You can come when you want. You can go when you want. In rising giants, liquidity is tighter. These companies are one seventh the size of CCP companies. Typical CCP company ka market cap two lakh crore hai. Typical rising giants company ka market cap kariban 30,000 crore hai, one seventh the size of CCP. Therefore, building the position is harder and therefore uh, there is a, a 15 month lockup. Because rising giants is, is riskier from a liquidity perspective and therefore it has a lockup, we also want to make sure investors who come into it have higher risk appetite, are cognizant that there are liquidity constraints. Hence the 15 month lockup on rising giants. CCP has no lockup. CCP may have jab out, jab chai out, jab chai jao. Rising giants 15 month lockup and a minimum minimum corpus of a crore. Uh, we'll stick to that. But yes, it's open for inflows. If you're willing to invest a crore and you're willing to uh, 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 sign off on the 15 month lockup, then uh, then of course you can invest in, in rising giants, right? Um, uh, 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 Tej, back to you. Question on, you know, Vasu, Vasuman Khandelwal asks, how come HDFC Bank and AU Finance Bank are in the same portfolio? Won't they compete with each other? And won't uh, uh, AU, by virtue of its size relative to HDFC Bank, be run over uh, by HDFC Bank? What is the moat of AU Finance Bank? Asks Vasuman Khandelwal, Tej. So if you look at uh, the KCB portfolio, there are a lot of uh, lenders. All of them uh, uh, are operating uh, within the same lending industry, but uh, there are different segments within the same industry. Say, uh, Avas would do only uh, home loans for the self-employed category. Uh, HDFC Bank, Kotak Bank would also do home loans, but they would do for the prime salaried segment, they'll give out loans at 7%. 
which ours would give out at 113%. Similarly, AU is focused on 80% uh, of its book is uh, focused on the self-employed category divided into two parts. 40% is vehicle finance, remaining 40% is small business loans. Given uh, the industry itself is so large that say someone like an AU would have a 1% market share uh, in the overall lending industry. Uh, HDFC Bank itself would have anywhere between 8 to 9% market share in the lending industry. Kotak Bank would have only a 2% market share in the lending industry. So there is a lot of room to operate for all of these players. And uh, the easiest sort of uh, target for all of these players from where they can gain market share is the 60-65% market share with PSU banks. Uh, there will be very minimal overlap between what say an EU would do and what a Kotak Bank or HDFC Bank would do. Uh, AU lends to self-employed category at 13 to 14% yields. HDFC Kodak Bank would not lend to these sort of borrowers. They, be, they may be lent to these borrowers uh, five years, 10 years out when these borrowers have a long enough track record and are able to borrow at maybe 8-9%. Thanks, Tate. So, Rakshit, I'll come to you. Anjan Niyogi uh, asks uh, that diagnosis companies may lose growth in the future because of competition is getting increased and existing hospitals are establishing their own diagnostics chains. So what do you think, Rakshit? Is competition increasing for Dr. Lal? In fact, uh, quite the other way around. So the industry is becoming more consolidated uh, from being a very fragmented industry. Just to give some numbers on that. Um, so uh, the whole diagnostic industry includes only 15% from Pan India, uh, uh, Pan India organized chains. Uh, the uh, the rest of the 85% is either mom and pop shops or or uh, government setups, uh, right? And uh, uh, the 15%, which is the pan India organized, is growing at a at a phenomenally faster pace uh, than the than the other 85%. So there's a massive market share shift from unorganized to organized here. Within the organized, uh, as you can see here in this slide, uh, uh, Dr. Lal Patlas is pulling away from the rest of the pack. Right, uh, which is uh, further consolidation within the organized space. Right, Dr. Lal currently is only six percent of the market share, and there's a long runway to go where, where market share gains will uh, will keep uh, keep be the uh, be, be a large driver of Dr. Lal's growth. Right, so that's uh, that's at a big picture level. Now coming to uh, uh, competition and uh, how uh, how sort of ground level execution will be playing out. Uh, first and foremost. Uh, uh, for someone like a Dr. Lal Pats Labs, uh, turnaround time of sample to report generation, sample collection to report generation, that's a massive competitive advantage, very difficult to break into overnight for anybody, right? That's a, that's a retail play competitive advantage. It's not so much a healthcare play competitive advantage. Uh, and that's a service offering, uh, no matter how deep a relationship you might have with a, with a doctor, no matter how, how many machines you might have in your own lab, uh, no matter how much of capex you do the the conversion the uh, turnover uh, of uh, of generating footfalls and then generating reports and giving a better service is a massive competitive advantage on top of it uh, as i highlighted previously uh, there are several investments that dr lal is doing which uh, other players are not doing as much uh, one is around home sample collection second is around expanding geographies uh, uh, which is uh, partly through acquisition of uh, uh, of suburban and partly through setup of their own reference laboratories in in Ghatkopar prior to suburban acquisition and also in Bangalore now, uh, which is uh, which is going to be the starting point of a hub and spoke model growth of Dr. Lal Path Labs. Right um, now, uh, when you look at this and then see uh, 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 what what lies ahead, so the next layer of consolidation of mom and pop shops. Uh, market share through Dr. Lal will be through partnerships. Uh, we believe where uh, a, a, a Dr. Lal will go to a go to a local uh, mom and pop shop lab and offer offer a partnership deal, uh, uh, saying that uh, the the lab can keep its uh, doctor relationship locally, can keep the footfalls, uh, but uh, by partnering with uh, Dr. Lal, uh, uh, the the mom and pop lab will uh, be able to provide much better. Uh, services to its customer, wider menu card, faster turnaround times, lower rates, uh, and hence an overall much improved experience. Uh, no question why uh, such a partnership model will not uh, will not work to its benefit uh, uh, for Dr. Lal Path Labs. And these initiatives are are uh, the drivers of their market share gains and competitive advantages 
new new players will keep entering existing players will keep exiting uh, that's been the case in the past as well uh, but uh, but a high quality compounder will keep compounding Thanks, Akshit. So let me just do a couple of other questions and then we'll wrap up for this evening. Uh, several of you are asking uh, whether LCP will be open for flows anytime soon. Um, it's not obvious that we can open it for flows in the next two, three months, but Ashwin is working with the research team on whether we can do a second avatar of LCP. Uh, what we do know is the first generation of LCP clients started investing in in August 2019, August 2019, and uh, and this year, this August 2022, their exit loads will will be will will go away, and since already these people have compounded by something like 130 uh, percent, so, uh, already the August 2019 vintage has compounded the wealth by 130 uh, percent cumulatively. Uh, I think there's a good chance some of those people will say, I want my money to say buy a flat or something like that. So if that sort of vacancy arises from August, uh, it'll allow us to take some inflows into LCP. Beyond that, you know, everything else, uh, as Mr. Shetty's research proceeds on, on LCP, we will have to see whether there's uh, fresh capacity there. Um, uh, lots of you keep uh, continuing to write that, look, we don't have 50 lakhs. What can we do with our money? Um, uh, as I said, we'll try to see, given the regulatory construct, what we can do for you. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to use the fact that our newsletters are available free of charge on our website, so just go to marcellus.in, you can get all the newsletters free, every single portfolio manager here, their newsletters are freely available. What you can do is use those newsletters to figure out what are the good stocks to invest in, right? Broadly speaking, a portfolio manager such as the gents on the screen give you two sets of skills. They give you stock identification and they give you position sizing. The position sizing, we can't give it to you for free because that's what a lot of clients are paying us for. But the stock identification, we're happy to share it in, in our books. So Diamonds in the Dust is easy, easily available on Amazon. You know, you can read that. Or if you don't want to spend 300 rupees buying a book, you can go to our website and read our newsletters and get the stock identification. In the meantime, we're working with our compliance team and with, uh, with, and with the regulators to see what can be done. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your business. And we continue, we'll continue to try compounding your wealth as best as we can. Thanks to the Marcellus team. And thanks, Pankaj, as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.